The topic for tonight is spirituality and leisure, or as some have suggested to me, it should be spirituality and pleasure, but uh, we'll, we'll stick to leisure tonight. Um, this is actually, well, I've, I've tried to uh, find an easy way out. This was supposed to be done last year, but because of the COVID pandemic, we had to cancel our lectures last year, so now we're just sort of picking up where we left off. Um, and this is actually a part of uh, this lecture, well, not this one, but the topic is a part of, um, of a course that we do at St. Cyril and Methodius Orthodox Institute, and I thought it might be an easy uh, uh, way, just slip one of those lectures into this one and <laughs> yeah, easy. However, when, when I looked at my notes, uh, it was impossible to talk about leisure without the previous lecture, what was Christianity and work, and that would take us for about six hours to finish all of that. And I thought, well, now I have to do everything from, from the scratch. Um, but it, it might not be that bad in the end. We'll see. I, I intend to talk for about an hour about spirituality and leisure, how, we, how do we understand the concept today of one and the other, and how did they develop throughout, through time, and um, in what way we can uh, help ourselves to, to integrate them into our life these days. Um, Orthodox spirituality is not an abstract mysticism, as, as a lot of people assume usually. It's not a pietistic and meaningless humming under a you know, dwindling candlelight that, that we often think when we say uh, spirituality, we, we often think of some uh, remote monastery, no lights. And uh, tonight we were singing the Vespers in a, in a language that we all can understand, but usually uh, in the Serbian churches, the, these uh, services are chanted or sung in the Church Slavonic, a language that barely anyone can, can understand, just a few words. So people just sort of switch off when they, when they come to Vesper service. And uh, because there's a lot of singing and it's all in, in a very foreign language that sounds kind of familiar, but it's, that, that's not really w what it means. And it just turns into a pietistic humming where you think, oh, it's, it's a nice setting for, to be spiritual. But that's not what spirituality in the Orthodox sense is. In the most general sense, we can say that Orthodox spirituality is the totality of a human being immersed in the sacramental life of the church. Now, for you that are taking notes, this is the first important one to take. So the Orthodox spirituality is the totality of a human being immersed in the sacramental life of the church. On a practical level, this would include, in the very least, a struggle against sins and passions, and an effort to develop Christian virtues. Christian virtues are humility, generosity, chastity, morality, philanthropy, temperance, meekness, zeal in faith and prayer. Um, this fight that, that happens, this, this spiritual struggle, is obviously an activity of the entire person, an ascetic life of the body, soul and spirit. And the first level of the spiritual life is the purification of the heart, of our spiritual heart. And this is what the fathers of the church call praxis. It consists from rooting out sin, learning, recognizing them, to, to recognize temptations, and to overcome them as well. And at the same time, of the constant perseverance in good things and development of good habits. And this asks for great efforts and a lot of work. And this work is predominantly noetic, but includes and welcomes some physical actions as well that are important to, to, to help. So spirituality in the Orthodox Church is a way of life that leads to the inner enlightenment, to the awakening of the nous. And the Holy Fathers describe this level of spirituality as theoria. This is the second level of spirituality. So you have praxis and then theoria. Uh, theoria, theoria is the level of contemplation, the illumination of the inner heart, and the noetic vision of the living God. This is the level that is attained through praxis. But even when we do attain this level, or when people attain this level, I shouldn't say we, uh, it doesn't usually last for long. You know, you get there, <coughs> and then you slide back, and then the praxis starts all over again. The third and final stage of spirituality in the Orthodox context is attaining the Holy Spirit, reaching divinization or theosis. So for us, when we say that someone is spiritual in the Orthodox context, this means that this person has attained the Holy Spirit 
or in other words that he or she is a saint. And saints are those uh, uh, people that, that are in union with God, those that became by grace what God is by nature. Everybody else is on the way. Uh, the way is the term that the early Christians used to describe uh, what we today call Christianity. So th this way, it's, it's a way of life, it's a way to salvation, it's the way to, to the uh, kingdom of God. And this way is mysterious for us and also uh, it's important to, when we say mysterious, we don't think in a sense that uh, it's esoteric, but it is sacramental. Uh, the word sacrament come from, comes from Latin and uh, mystery is, is basically a Greek synonym for, for the same term. Because it is traveling, it is active, it's activity, it's a way, and it's, it, it requires work, uh, it requires also energy. Energy is, is a Greek word, um, like himona. It's, uh, it, it's actually made of two words, en meaning in, and ergon, which means work. So uh, it means in work. To be, to be on the way means to be in work. And this being in work includes both man and God. So both man and God are in work together for someone's salvation. And this is called uh, synergy of, of man and God. So salvation is attained through synergy and, and the work is happening in the space of the church. Through the struggle that we, that we have to fulfill God's commandments and God's response uh, to, to our struggle comes from the sac through the sacraments. Uh, so if our life, our spiritual life is basically just work and struggle and work, how do we fit leisure into, uh, into our spiritual life? Well, uh, we humans are limited beings and our bodies and souls uh, get tired and we need rest. And we see this in nature uh, as God ordained day for us to work and night to rest. Just tonight when we started our Vesper service, at the beginning of any Vesper service, we read the Psalm 103 and in it we say, you make darkness and it is night when all the beasts of the forest creep about, the young lions roar for their prey, seeking their food from God when the sun rises, they steal away and lie down in their dens. Man goes out to his work and to his labor until the evening. Besides uh, this, I'm sure that all of you know about the Sabbath, or you heard of the Sabbath before as the Lord's Day of Rest. Uh, you know that God created the world in six days, and then on the seventh day He rested. And in His commandments to us, to, to Israel, uh, it, when He was sort of giving us a, a pedagogical um, instrument how to come closer to Him. Uh, this was one of the very important and significant commandments. Uh, um, so to, he insisted that we take one day a week for rest. We will examine both this natural need to rest that I've mentioned and the supernatural that comes as a command from God to rest. In, in a bit more detail later on, but for now it's enough to say that in both His natural and supernatural revelation, God is clearly saying to us that we need to have some time off work, time to rest, and, and some break from the routine, let's say. These little breaks, they can be very useful, uh, or sometimes they can be more useful than the work, or at least as useful as the work itself that's happening. Uh, you know, stops in active work are necessary in general, for, for recuperation, for the rest of the body and soul, but also as the intervals that imply the significance of work. Just think of a, a pause in a music piece. Uh, it might be an empty time, but it is a unit of time. And the notes would lose its meaning without the, this pause. So this little tiny pause means a lot in a music piece. Think of church bells. When, when the bells are ringing in the Orthodox tradition, we recognize uh, what are they saying to us? There's different traditions. So we know if someone passed away, we know that the bells are ringing sort of monotonously, you know, it's like one 
he, then there's a big pause in between, then another, then a big pause in between, and we know that this is for someone's funeral. When it's a, uh, lots of bells with little pauses, we know that it's, it's a liturgy, or it might be a wedding or, so, or baptism. Uh, we have this in, in, uh, in literature as well. Uh, we call it a dramatic pause. Sometimes it's called a pregnant pause. Uh, it's a moment or two of silence to heighten the anticipation before the reveal. You know, the Academy Award goes to... The point is that the break in the activity, no matter how empty it can seem, can be very valuable. And this uh, is no... Uh, it's not different in our spiritual life as well. Uh, when this period is longer than just one moment, as it might be in, in our everyday talk, uh, it can be filled with other activities that are beneficial for our life. You know, for example, uh, you remember that cartoon of, what's it called, Wiley Coyote? He has only one purpose in, in life, that's to get the roadrunner and ultimately to eat the, the bird. But he never, uh, he, he's never successful in this. So every, what happens when he, when he fails? Back to the drawing board. And, and he has a little pause and he thinks about it again, he plans it again, and then he's back at it again. And every time he gets a little bit better. Because it's just entertainment, of course, he will never get it, or I've heard it, apparently he might, but well, let's not get sidetracked. Um, anyway, it's important. He, the Wiley Coyote is telling us, Orthodox Christians, it's important for you to have a break and, and re-examine what you did up to that point. So how do we use this free time that we have? The period of time when we are not under pressure to must do something, when we decide of our own free will what we will do is usually called a free time or leisure. Leisure comes from the Latin word for license, which implies a permit or freedom to do something. Like a driver's license or a travel permit. The word leisure is often misused these days. And we commonly see it on the side of recreational complexes, you know, pools and spas and gyms. So it might be understood these days as a time for a hobby or generally uh, as a non-work time. And that's what most of us, when we say leisure, that, that's what we, the, the first thing that comes to our mind. We're not wrong entirely uh, in, the, in the context of today's society. I'll come, come to that later on. But uh, that's not how it started. Uh, the old Greeks used the term scholi for the same term. So what we, you, we use leisure from Latin, but the Greek word was scholi. And scholi meant time for learning or discussions or philosophy. That's how we get the word school. School comes from scholi, when you are free to uh, learn, to educate yourself. You, have, you don't have to do anything else. Uh, the Holy Fathers later used a Roman term another Latin term that's called otium. So leisure that we use today is, is sort of um, a combination of scholi and otium that, that, that were used in the times of, uh, let's say, the first five, six centuries. So Greek antiquity and the first five, six centuries of Christianity. Uh, what is important here to, to know is that both scholi and otium did not embody idle, idleness or a complete inactivity. Uh, <clears throat> this is the most important common thing for both terms. There's some different aspects uh, in, in both terms, you know, because different people have different understanding of what would, uh, what would be the best time to use your leisure. But for now, let's just remember that in neither case it was meant to be oblivion or idleness. So what are some of the most common understandings of leisure these days? Uh, a man called Richard Krauss wrote a book called Recreation, Leisure in Modern Society. And he identified five concepts of leisure. The classical view, leisure as a non-work activity, leisure as free time, leisure as a symbol of social class, and the holistic view of leisure. The first one is the classical view. The, cas the classical view emphasizes contemplation, enjoyment of self in, in search of knowledge, debate, politics, and cultural enlightenment. According to Krauss, it is a spiritual and mental attitude, a state of inward calm, contemplation, serenity, and openness. So you recognize something from the term scholi that is still present here. In the Roman society, otium, the Latin word for 
uh, for leisure was linked to contemplation and freedom. And the Greek ideal was modified in early Christianity where leisure became associated with the contemplative or spiritual life. So he classifies all this under the classical view, both the, the Greek, the Otium, and the early Christian view. Uh, the second one is leisure as a non-work activity. Leisure as a non-work activity view may be defined as a non-work activity in which people engage during their free time apart from their obligations of work, family, and society. Historically, the activity view of leisure was usually a uh, utilitarian view. It's the activity we engage in to achieve a benefit. <coughs> For example, we want to get better health, physical health. So you go, your, your uh, activity is running or walking or something else, or, or uh, spiritual health, so people meditating. Or, or you want to get some money, so you go gambling. That's a non-work. You don't have to do it, but you do it because you want to get something out of it. This is how you use your free time. Well, not, not everybody that's walking also get any <laughs> physical health back. <laughs> Third one is leisure as free time. In the pre-industrial societies, time was viewed cyclically. It was rooted in the rhythms of the natural world. People's lives revolved around sunrise and sunset and the change of seasons, you know, planting of harvesting crops and, and planting crops and so on. They did not separate work and leisure within their daily life. They would work and in the same time, or maybe integrated with that time, so they would you know, sing and pray and, and pass on traditions and get married and so on. The Industrial Revolution changed that. Unlike in all the previous eras, the work of the Industrial Age was focused on the factory and people moved into the cities, became socially isolated, started working in a specific profession and time away from work was free of the often very unpleasant demands of the work, uh, workspace. And that's, why it, that's how it became to be called free time. This free time became synonymous with leisure. The fourth one is leisure as a symbol of social class. Um, the concept of leisure as a symbol of social class understands leisure as a way of life for the rich elite. At the end of the 19th century, there was this American sociologist, Veblen, Thorsten Veblen. He wrote a book called The Theory of the Leisure Class, in which he questioned the intrinsic character of leisure activities and suggested that leisure behavior was influenced by the desire to impress others and distinguish oneself from other people. He defined leisure as a non-productive consumption of time. Time is consumed non-productively from a sense of the unworthiness of productive work and as an evidence of financial ability to afford a life of idleness. He used the terms conspicuous leisure and conspicuous consumption to suggest that the visible display of leisure and consuming was more important than engaging in the leisure activity for its own sake or for personal development motivations. So leisure had a symbolic nature. Now, uh, as I'm talking about this, if, if you're not asleep or thinking about dinner, uh, you are probably thinking of um, social media where we put up one picture of our life and how we are enjoying being at the beach and uh, yeah, as a priest I hear this often you know you, uh, you have someone in your parish has a Facebook profile and, and all of their photos are from their beautiful holidays around the world and you know every few days or so, there's a new one where they're enjoying with their family. So then they come to confession and say, I haven't had a, a, a day of work in the last 10 years or so. <laughs> Just, I'm, I'm falling apart, I'm dying. So, but you know, you feel this pressure from the society to put up this image of yourself being rich enough or wealthy enough or uh, capable enough of having free time as well, you know, because everyone else is doing it. However, none of us have any free time. The holistic concept of leisure is the fifth one. The articulation of the holistic concept of leisure emerged in the mid 20th century in connection and with an emphasis on understanding phenomena from a very holistic perspective, so all including. The holistic concept eliminates the dichotomy between work and leisure that has been a serious obstacle for many people's experience of leisure. Leisure is no longer viewed as a discretionary time and work as the supreme activity in life. This perspective calls for a value reorientation to confer value on leisure as value has been conferred, 
confirm don't work. Uh, to, to put this in, in perspective, some big and popular companies these days, like Google, for example, uh, are using these kind of, of tactics in their, uh, or, or they're implementing this kind of model with their, in, in a workspace. And, but it's not as sincere as it, as it might seem that they want, you know, so if you work in Google, you can have a nap whenever you want because there's a bed there, there's a couch, there's a, if you want to play games, there's games. So you can, you can spend as much of your leisure time there as you want as long as you stay there and work. So it's trying to reorient your, uh, or attract all of your attention to the company and to the pro productivity of the company. And, you know, so you don't need family or faith or beach for your leisure time. Uh, out of these five concepts that I've mentioned, the commonly accepted in modern leisureology and that's not a joke, that actually exists. People have jobs in, in that field. It's an academic discipline. I was as surprised as you are. <laughs> so <clears throat> in modern leisureology, it was the classical way that, that was very early on accepted by the Christians. The Greek ideal, where a person is free to debate on politics, philosophy, theology, whatever you want, uh, to be occupied by grand topics after you have completed you know, all of your necessary works, survived through the Roman concept of otium and got a new spark in the hesiastic ideal of the Orthodox monastic movement. In the early time, so 4th, 5th, 6th century, uh, the hesychism was most often understood as a time for contemplation, introspection, reflection, and of course for prayer, as we mostly understand it these days. Uh, but before we go deeper into that Christian understanding of leisure, I'll just mention briefly modern understanding of the work-rest balance. Um, all spheres of life are strangely intertwined in the post-industrial era, or some people call it this age now, they call it the I age, or the, with a capital I, or, or the consumerist age, because it, it brought about the blurring of the borders, uh, and we often feel that we do not have any free time at all, let alone any leisure time. So we got back uh, uh, the blurring of the lines in the in time division, just like in the pre-industrial era, but we kept the work ethics of the industrial era. And so it, it worked bad for us somehow and good for the capitalists. Uh, before COVID-19, almost a million full-time working Australians, which is almost 10% of the workforce, worked from home. The predictions were that this will go over 10% by 2026. The latest household impacts of COVID-19 survey, that was by the Australian Bureau of Statistics, that was conducted in February this year, showed that two in five people with a job, that's 41%, worked from home at least once a week in February 2021, compared with 24% at, le uh, at le least once a week before March 2020, so double. In New South Wales, 20% of the workforce worked from home before the pandemic. 20% of the workforce in New South Wales worked from home before the pandemic. It's 39% now. For those that work in an office, an average work week in 2016 was 41 hours. But this does not include reading of emails, analyzing data, writing reports, and everything else that you do from home when you get home. Uh, and, and, you know, before and after work, and of course on the weekends as well. So these hours were not included in the statistics. It's just the hours that you spent in the office. Back in 2013, there was a study published in the USA that proved that Americans and South Koreans work more hours than any other developed nation, because for decades the gross income per family was declining against the consumer basket. And compared to the rest of the developed world, Australians are among those who work the least. You know how much you work. Now, the rest of the developed work world works at least twice as much. A person that works as much and as hard is not capable of using his off work time in a quality way. In that sense, there are many critics of the classical way of, of the use of leisure time. And what they say, and they're correct in this way. What they're saying is that uh, we don't live in a Greek or Roman society where we spend our free time in our gardens and in squares and then we are 
debating and contemplating and talking about noble things and, and you know, global pleasure and uh, the value of some philosophical ideas or, or some uh, um, fate articles and so on. We live in a society or we feel that we live in a society that is more like the Greek, uh, we, we are sort of more in the role of the Greek and Roman slaves where the slaves who also lived at the time, uh, they were too tired after they day of work to, to come back home and to engage in sort of intellectual work or any kind of meaningful noetic work. Their free time, if anything, but, but, but rest, uh, was recreation and entertainment. And uh, the reason for that was so that they, in the morning they could be productive again and, 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 and work because that was the only value that they have. And we feel that, that this is happening with us as well. If you don't get up in the morning, if you can't get up in the morning and go to work, uh, very soon you will be replaced by someone else because you as a person don't have any value. You're just valuable as much as you can bring profit to your, to your company. There's a, uh, an American, an American Hungarian sociologist called Mikhail Csikszent Mihalyi. I'll give you $1,000 if you can spell that. I can even give it to you in paper. <laughs> Despite the fact this is what, what he says about uh, uh, how, how we live these days. Actually, before that, let me just say this. Uh, because of, of this life that, that we're living these days, that is so uh, uh, focused on consumerism and profit, not always from our, from our end, but we are coerced into it. Uh, the statistics show that by far the most popular way of spending free time in the developed world again is watching TV. The development of the new technologies and of the consumerist spirit in the capitalist world produced a very individual, individualistic way of using free time. Because we use our free time for ourselves. And this is how, and we use it on our own, by ourselves. And that's how we developed boredom. Even though we have all this technology around us, we are now uh, uh, boredom has become more common and more dangerous than any time before. Uh, this uh, uh, Csikszent Mihaly says this about boredom. Despite the fact that we are now healthy and grow to be older, despite the fact that even the, the least affluent among us are surrounded by material luxuries undreamed of even of a few decades ago, and regardless of all the stupendous scientific knowledge we can summon at will, People often end up feeling that their lives have been wasted instead of being filled with happiness and their years were spent in anxiety and boredom. Numerous psychologists made the connection between boredom with the use or abuse of leisure time. And the Holy Fathers also agree with them, especially some of our most modern ones. Well, uh, <coughs> St. Ignatius of Bichoninov said, complaining, uh, short temptress, despondency and especially despair are sins in front of God. These are the consequences of blasphemous lack of faith. Long before him, St. John of the Letter said, boredom is the breakdown of the soul, the disorientation of the noose, negligence of ascetic practice, hatred of monasticism, love of worldliness, irreverence toward God, forgetfulness of prayer. Uh, but boredom is also a natural consequence of the individualistic worldview. A person is burdened and with... with all the, with the entire world being on its shoulders. Uh, you come home after work, completely burned out, drained out of all of your energy, and you have no strength to talk to your family. You can't give anything to them. They can't give anything to you. Uh, you feel like a, uh, like a rag that someone wiped the floor of it. So you can't really communicate meaningfully. So you just watch TV. And you find something to watch that's uh, not very inspiring because you can't really be bo bothered with thinking now. So it's just something easy. Our physical and our mental cap uh, 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 strength is at full capacity. We can't receive any more information. And we can't give anything because we don't have anything valuable in us. So we feel practically coerced into a passive rest. 
watching TV or just sitting there relaxing. Uh, and that's not leisure. Because as I said, leisure comes from licere, a Latin word that means license. Uh, it implies freedom from prohibition or obstruction. Uh, literally, it means to be free to use the time regardless of necessary work. And as I mentioned also, the Romans used the word otium to describe the very similar phenomenon, but that include uh, otium was more structured. It had things to do in a sense as well. Uh, Otium was more in connection with contemplation, in which a person was free from obligations and, and was able to spend this sanctum otium in a garden, think about, you know, the greater picture of life. The Greek synonym, skoli, uh, uh, comes from the word, uh, the, the stem of this word, skoli, it means to have. Uh, one of the interpretations of the etymology says that etymological root of the word skoli means to pause or to stop, or rather to have silence or peace. Uh, and this was later developed into to have extra time, time that's especially just for you. Greeks used, uh, now this is interesting, the Greeks also used a negative term for work. Work was ascholia. So the work, the word for work was a negation of free time. So it wasn't, it was not the non-work that was negative in the ancient Greek society. It was work that was, that meant no freedom. You have to, it's a necessity. Uh, in Rome, in, in the Roman times, uh, so we had otium, meaning sort of uh, contemplation time, uh, holy time, and negation of otium was neg otium. That's business. That was the Latin word for business, negotium. So we have, we have negotiations from, from this word. St. Augustine, who lived in the end of the 4th and beginning of the 5th century in the Roman uh, era and in, 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 uh, in the Latin uh, lands, referred to free time as otium sanctum. He wrote that the appeal of leisure shouldn't be idleness or vanity, but searching for the truth. And that is why every true lover yearns for sanctum otium. And based uh, on this, he divided the time in, in a Christian's life into uh, work and non-work or as he called it, uh, vita activa and vita contemplativa. Now I'm going to uh, uh, try to sort of run, give you a rundown through, through time, how this changed into what it is today. Um, so obviously you have vita activa, vita contemplativa, the active time and the time for, for <coughs> the holy time. Uh, he was explicit that, that uh, you know, the holy time is better. So you, you might have to have both in your life, but this is obviously the better part of your life. Uh, a good example of this is when Christ comes to uh, visit Lazarus and uh, Martha and Mary. So Martha is there trying to work around him and to show hospitality. She is trying to do everything that she can so that he feels welcomed. <coughs> Mary is sitting next to him, listening to him, getting some spiritual uh, uh, nourishment fr from him, and he, Jesus says, uh, Mary has chosen the better part. It was the monastic movement that started in the fourth century that seized the concept of contemplative living and joined it with the biblical spirituality, turning it into a Christian mainstream. This is what we usually get our spirituality from and our values, spiritual values from. The main difference between the Christian era and the antiquity in this regard was not the value of free time, but the value of work. The church rejected the idea that work is a negative thing, not worthy of a spiritual man, and insisted that work is a scriptural command from the Lord since the creation of the world. The man was created to till the ground and to take care of the creation, to participate in God's work. The monasteries, they kept their hesychastic traditions and the contemplative character of life, but they also became the first factories and largest industrial units of the late antiquity and the middle, early Middle Ages. You know, in the Byzantine era, uh, the emperors gave so much money to monasteries, not only because they were so pious, but also because if you develop a large monastery in an area, that means a lot of new, work, a lot of new workplace, a lot of profit as well. You know, the, the forest has to be cleared out, and then you have to have people there to build it, and then people there to, to uh, take care of it. And it, it really becomes a, a hub for a business hub. 
So it was also a business initiative. Uh, the monastery economies became the templates for later macroeconomic processes, but the monastics were not focusing on the financial profit. This is the, the key difference. The monks, uh, for, for monks, the practical value of work was to fill free time so that one could escape the natural desires of the body. We might go into uh, too deep into monasticism if we continue on this part, but this is how they sort of that they look on it. Uh, Saint Benedict of Nursia in the sixth century established a rule called Ora et Labora, pray and work. And according to his rule, the monks each day devoted eight hours to prayer, eight hours to sleep, and eight hours to manual work. Uh, sacred reading and, and works of charity were sort of part of the manual work. Uh, in the rule of St. Benedict, we read this. Idleness is the enemy of the soul, and therefore at fixed times the brothers ought to be occupied in manual labor, and again at fixed times in sacred readings. End of quote. Now, the problem with this categorization is that for the first time ever, the work was not as important as much as the time. You put the time in, not the effort in the work. You know, uh, one leaves the garden, for example, when the time is up, not when the work is finished. So my eight hours are, are off, not my job anymore. I go to do something else. Thomas Aquinas, later on, built up on this with his categorization of the reality that included work as well. He categorized people into classes and occupations and divided work according to the value of what was produced by that work. In his view, our life is divided in two parts, spiritual and secular. The Catholic Church concluded that the so-called religious work and physical labor for the church were the holy work in the eyes of God, while the rest of the human work was inevitable evil. When Protestantism emerged in the 16th century, uh, one of our orthodox sociologists called uh, Kyriakos Markides, he said of, of Protestantism how they ch sort of changed the perspective of, of work in, in, in this era. Protestantism redirected believers to express their faith through a disworldly asceticism, orientation of the disciplined rational action within the world. All of the Protestant leaders you probably heard of Luther, Zwingli, Calvin. They all rejected this Thomistic structure, the dualistic structure of, of life, and taught that all types of work were equal, of equal value, and were all pleasing to God. So it doesn't matter if you were working, uh, if the profit of your work is going to help to build up a church, or you're just working to support your family. It doesn't matter if you're working as a a scripture teacher or you work as a manual laborer. For them, they say, no, it's all honorable before God. John Calvin, who was one of the main Protestant leaders, taught that the main goal of human life was not the struggle for personal salvation, but glorification of God through all activities. <coughs> not just spiritual activities, but also hard work in your secular work or secular work position as well. And he believed that men are called neither to spiritual exercise nor, nor to any quiet acceptance of grace, but to actively glorify God in their work. So the Calvinists understood their stewardship of God's creation very seriously, which meant that they were very involved in economic activities, wherever they were. They believed that it was their responsibility to work as hard as they could to show honor to God. Uh, as Max Weber showed, this reorientation of Western culture had as an unintended consequence the development of what we call the Protestant work ethic. You've probably heard of that. Another coincidence that further developed the spread of Protestant work ethics was that the Puritans from England that migrated to, uh, to America, to USA, later USA, uh, they were Calvinists. And they were the main leaders of the Industrial Revolution on the global level. <coughs> So the Puritans, the Calvinists, believed that if God gave you an opportunity to make $100 today, but you took some rest because you felt that you, $80 is enough for you. So you had an opportunity to earn $100, and you earned only $80 and then rested for a bit. They think that's a sin. You now sin against God. So rest became sin. The Western intellectual tradition of early modernity at least, 
was so saturated in humanism and the Renaissance that it gave a new dynamic to, uh, to, to the whole anti-religious sentiments in, in all aspects of life. Christian spirituality in the West became identified as socially backward and reactionary, lazy. So if you're being a Christian, if you're being spiritual, if you're spending time in prayer, that you just that's excuse to be lazy. In the era of humanism and the Renaissance, uh, the human being became the central value of the universe. Not God anymore, now it's the human being. Uh, Saint Justin of Chelius said that we reorientated from the God-man to man-God. And that's the, probably the shortest explanation of, of what secularism is. Uh, the ideologists of secularism and, and modernists among the Christians as well, thought that man is like God and just like God, a man has the right to have fun and to enjoy life and to give in to the earthly pleasures. And it was, <clears throat> there's nothing wrong with the concept in the beginning. However, this was a reaction to the Catholic teaching of the Middle Ages, but it just went to a different extreme. And with this development, the free time, leisure, turned from the contemplative hesychasm into a re recreation and fun. And with the development of technology and standards of living, fun became exclusively entertainment. Recreation comes from the Latin term recreatio, and it means to establish or create again, to fix or to renew something. In the context of, of our topic tonight, it's understood that we use recreation to gather new energy for work. So recreation in itself is not bad, but it's not synonymous with leisure. That's not the same. Uh, some sociologists define recreation as activity that rests men from work, often by giving them a change, distraction or diversion, and restores or recreates them for work. So you just need something to take your attention off what made you tired, and you, you refresh yourself a little bit, and then you come back uh, to, to be productive for your boss again. We can see that people often use the Sunday worship as a sort of recreation as well in our spiritual life. To get some energy to survive the week at work, we turn into recreational Christians. We come to church on a Sunday, but we think about the work waiting for us on a Monday. We fast, but with fake cheese and fake meat. We, we visit monasteries, but only when they are close to our holiday resorts. Uh, you know, we, we, we go to confession, but it's only to vent out some frustration that we have. We pray, but our prayers are often just uh, reading a, a, a wish list to God. So what we are doing, basically, is we're putting the time in. We're not doing the work, we just put the time in. And synergy with God is suffering in, in, in that. The modern la man lives in a world developed mostly under the influence of Calvin and Marx and of the Industrial Revolution. So we have suddenly found ourselves in the factories, packing boxes in three shifts and being paid for it. And since packing a box or writing a contract or a lecture is meaningless outside of the bigger picture. And this pic bigger picture is not visible to us anymore be because we, we can't afford it. So we just put the time in. <clears throat> and that became the only tangible measure of our value. Only how many boxes have I packed? That, that tells you how valuable I am as a person. The work-rest balance is lost, and leisure became a waste of time, idleness, and laziness. And that this is a cardinal sin in the consumerist society. And this is why spirituality is often contrasted with work. For the post-Christian societies, this is a cause of frustration and friction. There's a push in the Western countries, including Australia, to switch to a so-called seven-day seven day week economy. Uh, some countries, mostly Catholic countries like Croatia, for example, or uh, Poland, uh, they recently protected the sanctity of free time on a Sunday, but they got a lot of backlash from the civil movement. The president of Serbia recently had a psychotic fit and a nervous meltdown on the national television. When he was asked about this, he was yelling at the journalist. Now, I, I, I did a little bit of translation. So this is, he's in the studio, they're asking him, what do you think about, there was this, they, they did a, a study or, uh, on how people react, do, do people want to have Sunday off? His reaction, why do you not allow us to work on a Sunday? 
I don't care if I don't get one vote on the elections, but I will not be flattering to anyone by not working on a Sunday. I don't want to do that. In Serbian, neću to da radim. He's using the word radim, work. I don't want to do that. Do that is rest. Why should I not work? I don't feel like resting. I hate resting. I can't lay down. I hate laying down. Lying down. By the way, in Serbian, the word for Sunday is nedelja. It means nedela, no work. So, <clears throat> and we see that even in the church as well. Uh, among the clergy, very often we value a priest by the amount of time he spends in his car, chasing around the city, cutting the grass around the church, working in a secular job, cleaning the property. And when this costs him in his spiritual life and his parish is turned into a small or a medium business, we justify him and we say, oh, you know, but he's so hardworking, his parish is so financially secured, they have so many properties, uh, you know, there's so many people involved somehow, but there's no one taking communion. So the parish is dead. However, the spiritual life is inconceivable without some quiet time, without some proper leisure time. Every great feast day in, in the author's calendar has its own four feast, its feast and its apodosis or dania. We have Lent to prepare us for the greatest feasts. Lent is not simply a change in our diet. Uh, it includes also a peaceful time and some introspective work, purification, some social distancing, as this was a popular term these days. Uh, so this is, for example, this is why you can't have a party in Lent. It's not about the food that you eat. Of course you can have a party with, with, with seafood. But that's not in the spirit of Lent. You can't have a, 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 a Lenten party. It's just inimaginable. You, it's because you can't have a feast and fast at the same time. Lent can only be fruitful when there is some sanctum otium included, some holy time, some time for you to reflect. Uh, the Bible and the history of the church tells us the same. You know, when the apostles came back from their first mission, when Jesus Christ ordered them to, to go on their first mission, when they came back, he gives them a, a new command. He says, come aside by yourself to the, a deserted place and rest a while. That's in Mark 6.31. So he's showing everyone involved in preaching and teaching to this day that they must rest and should not work continuously. Even God, as we said, rested on the seventh day after creating the world. You know, the Bible says, by the seventh day, God has finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. That's Genesis 2. Not only that, but he commanded us to respect the Shabbat. The Shabbat is the Lord's day of rest. Remember the Shabbat day to keep it holy. And later, on, as you go through the text, it, it gets expanded. And it says, six days you shall do your work, and on the seventh day you shall rest that your ox and your donkey may rest, and the son of your female servant and the stranger may be refreshed. This is for us to remember, that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for Sabbath. The Sabbath is a Jewish word that would literally mean to cease or to stop. So it's basically the same as holy in its meaning. Jews understood that the command of, on work uh, 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 ceasing at, at certain times, literally. So in fear not to insult the Lord, they have made it a law that on a Saturday, not only do they, they don't do any work, but they don't even touch work tools. They don't cook food. They don't light a fire. And, and they, they sort of, they count the number of steps that they can make and so on. So they, they can't use a lift and it, it gets complicated for them. We have a different understanding of, of the same commandment. First of all, there's a difference in the day itself. You know, Saturday is still the seventh day for us in, in our week. Uh, th there was some confusion about uh, one of our lectures, what's the next Wednesday? Because we still haven't, uh, uh, in ourselves, uh, settled down on what is the seventh day, what is the first day, you know. So for us, Saturday is still the seventh day. Sunday is the first day of the week. However, Sunday is also the eighth day of the week. It's the day that has no uh, a sunset. The day of resurrection, Sunday, the day of the resurrection, resurrection of our Lord, is our day of rest now. It's our Sabbath. It's the Lord's day. Uh, so the question, can we do laundry on a Sunday or a feast day, uh, is not a serious theological question for us because of this. You know, people in the Old Testament had the uh, uh, one understanding 
but but uh, the Sabbath law in the Old Testament was more a pedagogical measure. Uh, Saint John Chrysostom says, "For indeed the Sabbath did at the first confer uh, many and great benefits. For instance, it made them gentle towards those of their household and humane." It taught them God's providence and the creation, as Ezekiel says. It trained them by degrees to abstain from wickedness and disposed them to regard the things of the Spirit. How beautiful is that, to have a command like that in your history, so that God himself taught you how to treat others and how to respect the time of others, how to respect your own time, and how to be compassionate, how to have empathy. But in the New Testament, he says, let us keep the feast then continually, and do no evil thing, for this is a feast, and let our spiritual things be made intense, while our earthly things give place. And let us rest a spiritual rest, refraining our hands from covetousness, withdrawing our body from our superfluous and unprofitable toils, from such as the people of the Hebrews did of old endure in Egypt. For there is no difference between us who are gathering gold and those who are bound in the mire, working at those bricks and gathering stubble and being beaten. For now, too, the devil bids us make bricks, as Pharaoh did then. For what else is God than Maya, and what else is silver than stubble? Like stubble, at least, it kindles the flame of desire, like Maya, so does gold defile him that possesses it. So we begin our feast day with work, with liturgy. We are working, but in and for the kingdom of heaven. This work still ask for our time. We still have to dedicate some time for this work. So if you sleep in on a Sunday because God said take some rest, that's not the respect that, that God deserves. But if you have dedicated your Sunday to the Lord, you went to the church, you spent time with your family in a pious and, and quality way, you visited the graves of your, of your dead, for example, or, or you helped the sick, then of course you can do your laundry as well. There's no problem with it. But as long as we remember that our Sabbath is a gift from the Lord to be free from necessities, to have some time off the world to meet with the Lord. We sing in the liturgy, Let us who mystically represent the cherubim and sing the thrice holy hymn to the life-giving Trinity, lay aside all worldly cares that we may receive the King of all, invisibly escorted by the angelic hosts, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. To lay aside all worldly cares and to contemplate God are the highest expressions of orthodox spirituality. This is theoria in practice. The only highest level of spirituality is the actual theosis, or union with God. And this is why this prayer is right here in the liturgy, because we are about to receive the Holy Communion and to be united with God. So the liturgy is taking us up. It's giving us a practical guide through the orthodox spirituality. It's awakening our noose. It's, it is, uh, it's asking us to be watchful, to have a neptic life and to strive to God. And uh, for those of you that are still awake, I'm about to conclude. Um, we can observe that a man is a psychosomatic being, uh, it, limited in strength and with a natural need for rest. We don't need to feel guilty about this. It is okay to rest and to watch TV. It's perfectly okay to have a hobby or recreational activities sports, fishing, reading, hiking, golf. But we also see that a man is a spiritual being in need of God. We also need a healthy and a vacant heart, a spiritual heart, a noose. And in order to direct our physical, mental, emotional, and volitional power towards God, we need time, we need a time off from the worldly cares. We need a spiritual respite. And God promised us such time. He offers that respite and gives us leisure time as a gift. And if we confuse this gift and this leisure time with recreation, or as we pass it as a dead time, as we sometimes do, you know, being bored out of your mind, then we develop an unhealthy spirituality. And such a person that St. Apostle Paul calls a natural man, in 1 Corinthians, is in a desperate need of healing because he's not, his, his uh, person is not whole in front of the Lord. Uh, and the Orthodox method of healing is purification, illumination, and deification. 
And this, this means spiritual work. So like any other work, it needs time and it asks for time in which we are delivered from our necessities. So the time in which we are free to, from necessities to work on our spiritual health is the true leisure. And this is how Orthodox spirituality works with leisure. Thank you.